This is a Clark University podcast. Consider yourself lucky if our paths never cross. Except luck isn't real, nor is karma, or sadly, justice. As much as I'd like to pretend these concepts exist, they just don't. One is born, lives their life, and eventually, one dies. So The Killer was a film that a lot of people, a lot of Fincher bros, such as myself, hotly anticipated. So I was ready to see this, and I watched it on the first night that it was available on Netflix. <laughs> I'm very impressed by this film. I would say it's honestly, and this is uh, this is an honest ranking, it's number three on the on the Fincher scale of all the films that he's made. I put this one at number three. And I'm going to tell you, however, that I've recommended this film to numerous people, largely civilians, not screen studies people, and to a person, they hated it. Really? So... <laughs> So, so this is not this is not a film. Can you name names, or can you tell us what kind of civilian rank they have? Relatives, neighbors, you know, people that often ask me for movie recommendations, and I'm like, yeah, watch Fincher's The Killer. It's fantastic. And they get back to me in about two days. They're like, what? The Killer, directed by David Fincher, was one of the standout films of 2023 for Screen Studies professor Hugh Mannon. With award season upon us, we asked Hugh and two other Screen Studies professors, Jed Sommer and Soren Sorensen, to share their thoughts on three of last year's cinematic standouts. Jed, Hugh, and Soren are hosts of the Clark podcast Recommended For You, which is known as RFU among their students, who submit movie titles for the professors to watch and discuss. Hey, I'm Professor Jed Sommer, uh, Clark University Screen Studies. I'm Soren Sorensen. Ditto. I'm Hugh Mannon. Double ditto. The killer is about an assassin who screws up. So, so right off the bat, it's this expert who's telling you how expert he is, and he blows it right out of the gate. And then the film is kind of a series of ways that he has to make up for or bring kind of into square the fact that he screwed up this n- initial assassination attempt. I love this. I think it's exactly what a lot of people have said. It's kind of a metaphor for Fincher's own meticulous perfectionism as a director. The film, I think, clearly knows this. So I think that there's probably a a kind of tiny little subgenre of films that's directors using fictional scenarios and even non-fictional scenarios to meditate on their own directorial plight. Next up is Bottoms, directed by Emma Seligman. I can't believe they're letting you guys start a fight club. No, they're they're not. We are not. What are you talking about? We're going to do it. We're doing it. PJ, I wasn't being serious. Josie, did you see the way that Isabel and Brittany were looking at us? <sighs> also, you heard the announcements. Girls are terrified. It's perfect. They need this. OK, no, they need, like, mace, maybe. We can't do that, OK? We'd be misleading them. Guys do that all the time, OK? That's the point of feminism. That's not the point of feminism. You also don't care about feminism. Your favorite show is Entourage. You're missing the point. I don't really think I am. I love and adore Bottoms. Its originality comes from its knowledge of film history and its knowledge of like genre film history in particular. So it is in deep dialogue with like the teen comedy and the rom-com action movies and epics and detective films. It's in such control of its chaos, delivering these various genre pleasures, doing it with the stupidest of genres really, really tickles my, my, my funny bone. It's like it's, it's being playful in a way that truly appears to not care, yet all those ducks are in a row. Like, all the references are just exactly on point. It's like it's it's being playful in a way that truly appears to not care. It's a film that kind of has the sharpness of someone in their 20s or early 30s. Just like the facial expressions on the characters, they're just perfect, right? You, you'll see two characters on screen, somebody says a line off screen, and Ayo Adibri's eyebrow goes up, or they look off the screen in a certain very particular way, and eyes dart around, and it's just magic. And it's and it's not 
coachable. It's not teachable. What's great about the film is completely unplannable. I'm teaching slapstick comedy right now. I love Charlie Chaplin. That was his mode of production too, when he finally got in the groove of like, and had total creative freedom. It's like plan, plan, plan. And then like, play 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 right you know it reminds me of listening to like a really dense record that you like where you have to listen to it again because if you watch one one of them you're missing what the other three are doing the whole time or yeah. if you miss one interaction if you if you're watching one interaction action you're missing four others and um there's just kind of this this balancing act that's being um taken on while also the 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 density of the jokes being delivered reminds me of like a tina fey thing or like it's like 30 rock or like kimmy schmidt or something it's just it's constant jokes i've seen reviews online where people say I don't get it and I'm just here to tell you if you don't get it then you simply have no sense of humor like this is the funniest <laughs> damn film that I've seen in in years like it's just it delivers the goods and I just I I I don't know what people think funny is if they don't like this film I truly don't and and no, not to offend listeners but what? Like, you think that film's not funny? There's a close friend who was like, I don't know. Really? Last on their list is Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, directed by Christopher McQuarrie. Okay, well, what's always approaching, but never arrives? Um, wait, 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 I know this one. The clock is ticking, Luther. Riddles aren't my thing, Benji. What more can I say? We're running out of time! There he is. Well, this is too easy. Sorry to bother you, Ethan. Would you happen to know what's always approaching but never arrives. What is always approaching, but never arrives? Tomorrow. What? Always approaching, but never arrives. Tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. I definitely want to talk Mission Impossible. <laughs> I want to talk about... We love Tom Cruise on our What's Seven? the number? MI8? Seven, I think. MI7 colon hyphen DR part uh, okay. one? <laughs> I love this movie. Um, I think we know from the Top Gun conversation that I love Tom Cruise, and the man knows how to make a movie. The films are really fun to watch, and I think we're just kind of like, oh, well, what's he going to do next? And he's going to ride a motorcycle off a cliff. He's going to go to space. He's going to go underwater, and all this kind of stuff. And it's almost like just like going to a circus. You don't, you're not watching it for social realism, and it's not slow cinema. It's the sort of the opposite thing. Let me let me just give you my dime store analysis of the Tom Cruise, the late Tom Cruise phenomenon. So he's he's good in these films, I'll admit it. But he's also a kind of a, a coat rack that other interesting narrative things, performances, new stars that you haven't seen before sort of get hung on and they become part of what makes the film a Tom Cruise movie. So it, it, like he needs to But Cary Grant do his was that thing. too. I mean like lots of lots Absolutely of movie stars right. were that, right? 100%, yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So he's not unique in that, but he's having this late phase success because in part it it's the supporting cast that sort of buoys these films up and you saw it in Maverick. I mean it's it's not all him. The climax of this film is nuts, right? That thing where he parachutes in the side of the steam train that's hanging off a mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's just deus ex machina. Like, like the, everything's going to go to hell. And then just randomly at that exact moment, he happens to parachute. It's, it's ludicrous, right? Yeah. I was coming into this call being like, Bottoms and Mission Impossible are the same movie. Like, neither of these films, if you're having an amazing time... Are you there for the plot? Yep. The plot is incidental. We mm. we have plots because we're told we need to have plots. That like apparently we're not allowed to release experimental cinema in the theaters. Maybe this is the truth of 2023. We are not going to the movies for plot. We are going for like these moments, sometimes of revelation, but sometimes of hilarity, sometimes of bodies and spectacle, bodies and movement. Totally agree. Yeah. If you say to the listening audience, if you don't like bottoms, then you might need to investigate whether you in fact have a sense of humor. Like it's the same thing here. Like if you don't like MI7 colon dash dash PT hashtag, whatever. It's not that complicated. <laughs> if, if, if you don't like this, then maybe you don't like movies. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a bet. Like, I bet you can't make a film where, like, the bad guy is just AI cloud. Like, it's just kind of right. like, and that's literally what they did. And I think I think on paper it sounds absolutely absurd. And it's like, to me, it's sort of a brave choice because it's like, well, what else is the bad guy in, in 2024? Yeah. It is absurd. It is stupid. It is on, like, paper a bad choice. But I think there's a freedom in it. Like, mm. so they're like, 
well, we take this premise and we appear to be topical right. <laughs> in our choice of context. Yeah. And yet we're not invested in like the questions of AI and where our, where humanity is headed. But instead, like what sort of like set pieces <laughs> does such a yeah. premise enable? I defy anyone to watch those last 10 minutes. Unhinged. So good. The yeah. train thing? Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Like the train the thing? Yeah. They just keep dropping off. One at a time. Grace, Grace, you have to let go. Grace, you gotta let me go. You gotta let me jump across. Or we're gonna die. Do you trust me? You gotta trust me or not? You gotta trust me. Grace. Cinema and trains are like peanut butter and chocolate. And this like... Even though like 130 years have happened, we're like still doing it. Yeah, that's right. It's so. And some people perfect. have a peanut allergy, and you know what? It's not for them. Uh, what, and that's fine. You know, take your lactate. I don't know. <laughs> to learn more about screen studies at Clark, visit clarku.edu/screen-studies. Send all your criticisms about these films and any of our professors' opinions to the folks over at RFU. To listen to more RFU episodes, see the link in our show notes. Challenge Change is produced by Andrew Hart and Melissa Hansen for Clark University. Find other episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. One, two, three, Clark! We're taking a week off for spring break. We'll be back with a new episode on March 15. TTYL and beware of the Ides of March.